All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. Sorry to rush you through all the great posters and the lunch. Um, we uh, are celebrating our afternoon now, so welcome back. Um, we really do hope you enjoy the poster and the networking session. Uh, we have a very exciting afternoon with our translational research panel focused on neurodegenerative disorders and the plenary, closing plenary session on inclusivity and intersectionality in dementia research. So please uh, stay through all this and you'll be so excited. We also want to give a, a shout out to our longest travel person coming to the meeting today from Puerto Rico. Where did he go? He was just saying, there he is. Yay! So give him a hand. So he's a CTSI scholar, Dr. Avocado. Um, so feel, please feel free to say hello to him. That's great. All right, so to begin the research panel, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Bruce Lamb, who is the executive director, uh, Paul and Carol Stark Neurosciences Research Institute, and a distinguished professor of IU and professor of medical and molecular genetics and pharmacology and toxicology. So uh, for those of you that are unaware, the IU Stark Neuroscience Institute was officially dedicated in 2003, and right now is home to over 100 researchers with around 75 million in extramural funding. So Dr. Lamb has really been instrumental in moving the needle on Alzheimer's research through his own research and that of the center. So he is focused on genetic and immune modifiers identified in mouse and human studies. So he has moved from large human population studies identifying genes to animal models to understand mechanisms, very similar to the types of studies we heard from our wonderful plenary speaker this morning. And then he actually has gone back and trying to figure out how to actually treat um, patients and make druggable targets that um, through another program. So basically he has the NIH model AD grant that facilitates this translational work of human to mouse, um, and then facilitating research by giving these animal models throughout the US and abroad. He's also co-director of the NIH funded IU School of Medicine, Purdue University TREAT AD Center, standing for Target Enablement to Advance Therapy Development for Alzheimer's Disease, mouthful there. That's a center on focusing, as I mentioned, these struggle targets in search of new therapies. So I think when we talk about translation from mouse to human to drug to treatment across the spectrum, Bruce does it all. Uh, so Dr. Lamb is also actively involved in advocacy, um, another important thing that we need to do for, to help research. And his advocacy is for increased funding in Alzheimer's research. And for that, he received the National Civic Award and the Lifetime Achievement Award for the, from the Alzheimer's Association. So he was also elected as a fellow of the American Association for the Advancements of Science. So thank you, Bruce, and welcome. Thank you so much, Sharon. <clears throat> it's a great pleasure to be uh, with all of you here today. Um, and uh, it's really exciting to sort of see this panel on neurodegenerative disease, expertise and in innovation and in translational research. And I'd sort of want to start by just sort of, I think, painting a bigger picture. And I'd sort of say we are really at a transformational moment um, in, in time for both research and clinical care for neurodegenerative diseases. Um, we are beginning to see the first FDA-approved treatments move forward for a number of these diseases. And as one, I think, important example, particularly for today's panel, um, uh, the first disease-modifying treatment for Alzheimer's disease, uh, lecanemab, uh, which was developed by ASI, received traditional uh, approval by the FDA on July 6th of this year, so very, very recently. Yeah. And then, in addition to that, um, the, um, there was another drug, uh, denanumab, developed by Eli Lilly, our, our, our colleagues here in town. Uh, and these results of a positive uh, phase three trial were presented at the Alzheimer's Association International Conference in Amsterdam this summer. Uh, and, and the FDA, uh, from all accounts, will be considering approval uh, in the coming months, potentially even by the end of this, this calendar year. So with that, I think the field is just really quickly uh, pivoting uh, to think about a wide variety of other issues that immediately come up once we have uh, the first of, of two, hopefully, FDA-approved treatments. And that includes everything from talking about how do we um, get uh, treatments to the patients? How do we have the health system prepared to do all of this work um, to get these treatments? 
Um, alternative therapeutics targets these, these treatments, while they certainly are the first FDA approved, they're clearly not where we ultimately want to be. Um, and so we need to think of new targets. Combination therapies, how do we start thinking about, okay, add, looking at the approved treatments plus others um, in, in different biological categories. We need to understand and, and develop better disease diagnostics uh, so we can identify patients at the earliest stages possible and much more. Uh, and again, and I think you'll see some of this in the themes that will be presented um, here uh, today. And I'd say notably, Indiana University and other CTSI-supported institutions, I think, really play a major role in the national fight, international fight, against Alzheimer's disease and other neurodegenerative diseases as well, with major NIH-funded uh, programs um, at the academic centers, as actually well as many uh, biotech and pharmaceutical companies that are sort of right here in town. So I think Indiana, in my estimation, is really at the center, again, of a lot of the exciting developments uh, in this space. And so on this day after World Alzheimer's Day, so World Alzheimer's Day was indeed yesterday, uh, it sort of seems fitting um, to, to have this panel and, and have this discussion. So just first, a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, I, am, uh, I wanted to first, we're going to have each uh, panelist uh, give their 15-minute presentation un, un, uninterrupted, so we will not be taking questions at the end. Um, and so the idea is we can maximize our time at the end so we really can have a good panel discussion. Um, so please save your questions. Uh, and for those um, on the virtual platform, I really encourage you to submit questions. Uh, and please, when you do submit a question, identify is there a particular panelist that you would like to direct that question to, or whether it's a general question for the entire panel. Um, and so again, we'll just now go ahead and get started. Um, so what I'm gonna do now is just introduce all of the panelists uh, up front. So again, we can save time and then we'll have each one uh, come up to give their talks. <clears throat> so the first panelist is uh, Brielle Stark from the IU Bloomington campus, who will be speaking on a lexical access during discourse, subtle differences in stroke, mild cognitive impairment, and typical aging. Dr. Stark is an assistant uh, professor in the speech, language, and hearing success department and program in neuroscience faculty at Indiana University Bloomington. She completed her doctoral research in clinical neuroscience at the University of Cambridge, uh, UK, as a, a Gates Cambridge Trust Scholar and a postdoctoral fellowship at the Center of the Study of Aphasia Recovery at the University of South Carolina uh, pri prior to joining the IUB faculty in 2018. Dr. Stark's research characterizes language and communication using neuropsychological and neuroimaging methodologies post-stroke in typical aging and in neurodegenerative disease. She's particularly interested in spoken discourse, uh, manual gesture, and inner speech, uh, the experience of speaking to ourselves in our head. Um, in 2021, she was honored with the IU Faculty Excellence and Mentoring Award from the Center for Women and Technology, as well as the IU Trustees Teaching Award, uh, evidencing her commitment to teaching and mentoring. In 2021, she was also named one of four Distinguished Aphasia Scholars USA, a national award given by the Tavistock Trust UK and was one of six pre-tenure faculty awarded the Outstanding Junior Faculty Award 2022 to 2023 from Indiana University Bloomington. So our next speaker after uh, Dr. Stark will be uh, Dr. Dustin Hammers from the IU School of Medicine. He's also a member of the Stark Neurosciences Research Institute who will be speaking on early onset Alzheimer's disease uh, research updates. Justin Hammers is a board certified clinical neuropsychologist and associate professor in the Department of Neurology at the Indiana University School of Medicine. He is the lead neuropsychologist involved in the NIA funded Longitudinal Early Onset Alzheimer's Disease Study, or LEADS. And he is currently the principal investigator on the NIA and Alzheimer's Associated Funded Study, Lifestyle Interventions for the Treatment of Early Onset Alzheimer's Disease Study, or LIGHTS. He is also affiliated with the Indiana Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, or the IRDRC. His research has emphasized the evaluation of diagnostic consistency between cognitive and advanced AD biomarkers, beta amyloid and tau, in an effort to improve diagnostic accuracy. Additional areas of interest have included examining the assessment of cognitive change over time, tele neuropsychology, and the detection of early memory decline in elderly and dementia populations through computerized batteries and novel learning measurements. He currently serves as the Associate as Editor of Developmental Neuropsychology and the Grand Rounds Editor of the Clinical Neuropsychologist, and has recently served as the guest editor for the Journal of Clinical and Experimental Neuropsychology. 
In addition to being the lead neuropsychologist for the multi-center um, study, uh, NIA-funded anti-NNBA receptor encephalitis extinguished trial, he is the past chair of the American Psychological Association's Committee on Rural Health and is currently a, a liaison for the Public Interest Advocacy Committee, APA Society for Clinical Neuropsychology. Our third speaker uh, will be Jeffrey Day, who is from IU School of Medicine and also a Stark Neurosciences Research Institute member, who will be speaking um, on biofluid biomarkers to aid in Alzheimer's disease diagnostics and drug development. Dr. Daig is a Senior Research Fellow of Neurology at Indiana University School of Medicine and primary member of the Stark Neurosciences Research Institute. He received his PhD from the University of Cincinnati in Ohio, where he worked in the area of protein characterization using mass spectrometry. He has been in the pharmaceutical industry for the last 28 years and has contributed to many therapeutic discovery programs um, um, and uh, through uh, analytical measurement of biologically relevant molecules and cell culture, preclinical models, and human clinical samples. His research at Indiana University is focused on the discovery and development of novel biomarkers for Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. Over the last several years, he led the discovery and development of ultra-sensitive ultra -sensitive immunoassays to measure phospho phosphorylated tau, uh, that we heard a bit about this morning, in blood uh, for use in Alzheimer's disease diagnosis, prognosis, and clinical trials. These blood-based biomarker assays have led us to a dramatic change in AD research and clinical development. And then our final panelist for today uh, will be Dr. Alan Paukowitz, speaking on Treat AD, Exploring the Target Landscape for Alzheimer's Disease and Accelerating New Therapeutics. Dr. Palkowitz is currently the president and CEO of the Indiana Biosciences Research Institute and is also a senior research professor of medicine at the IU School of Medicine in the Division of Clinical Pharmacology. He leads the IUSM Purdue uh, Treat AD Center that we heard uh, Sharon introduce, um, an NIH-funded initiative focused on discovering potential new therapies for Alzheimer's disease. Prior to this, Dr. Palkowitz served as the Vice President of Discov Discovery Chemistry Research and Technologies at Eli Lilly and Company, where he worked for 28 years. In his role as Vice President, Dr. Palkowitz was responsible for the global small molecule drug discovery strategy and delivery of clinical candidates in disease areas, including cancer, diabetes, immunology, pain, and neurodegenerative disorders. As a member of the Lilly Research Laboratory's leadership team, Dr. Palkowitz participated in setting strategic direction for the company along with governance of the discovery and early clinical development pipeline. Additionally, Dr. Palkowitz has served on several prominent uh, advisory boards and committees, including the most recently, the NIH NCATS Advisory Council and the National Academy of Sciences Board on Chemical Sciences and Technology. He has published numerous research articles and is an investigator of, on, uh, in, and is an inventor on almost 60 US patents. So um, now, from now, we're going to move on to the talks themselves. So again, please share your questions, especially those online. Uh, make sure you write them down and put them in the chat. Uh, so we will first up, we will hear from uh, Brielle. And I don't know, do I need to move the slides here? OK, there we go. Um, so there, our first, uh, uh, as I mentioned, will be uh, Dr. Brielle Stark. Thanks, Bruce. That was a great introduction. I'm a clinical and cognitive neuroscientist who works down at IU Bloomington. I'm also a language scientist. So I work, Dustin and I were just talking about this, at the end of the translational sphere. All of our work is in humans with human participants. Um, so I'm hoping to share with you today something that we have recently started working on. Um, massively in collaboration with speech therapists who are some of my core clinical colleagues. So I mentioned I'm a language scientist. I study discourse, which is here in the middle of this diagram. Traditionally, when we are looking at aphasia or looking at language impairments, for example, in primary progressive aphasia, which is common in frontotemporal dementia, as we know, we are looking at single word and other fairly constrained tasks. Verbal fluency being one, name as many words you can think of starting with the letter F in 60 seconds. Picture naming is another really common one. I work more toward uh, moving toward more ecologically valid methods where I'm having people talk about things in context, which is what I'm gonna call discourse throughout this talk. And we constrain it a little bit to give ourselves a little bit of experimental constraint by giving people topics to talk about and having it be monologic. So we will give back channel feedback to make it seem like they're having a conversation, but it's really more a monologue. So that's what I'll be focusing on today is extracting information from monologic discourse. 
So there are three tasks that I'm going to describe to you today. I wanted to give an example because I don't think everyone's familiar with what I mean by discourse. Probably the most common aspect of discourse you all have seen is the cookie theft picture. Today, we're going to talk about a similar thing, which is a single picture description. You see there the cat rescue. If you're interested, I have the instructions that um, most of us language scientists or neuropsychologists will give to a person to describe this and give them a little bit of direction. In the middle is not my favorite, but very commonly used task, uh, the Cinderella narrative, which is commonly called a fictional narrative with some autobiographical memory components because people usually have a tie to the story if they're born in the US. That's the caveat. Um, and you can see the instructions there as well. And the last one is more of a spatial procedural narrative. It's how to do something. The most common usually is all about making something like a sandwich, doing laundry, doing gardening, et cetera. We like it because it elicits a lot of spatial words and imagery, um, and that can be quite sensitive to looking at gesture as well. It tends to elicit a lot of hand movements if you're interested in multimodal communication. So what I'm gonna talk about today is what I call a low hanging fruit, which is our most basic level of looking at discourse, which is the linguistic level. At this level, you've got a lot of information that's fair game to look at and to evaluate across uh, diagnostic profiles. I was trained in clinical aphasia, which is a language impairment after stroke most commonly. It can absolutely happen after traumatic brain injury as well. Um, and it is becoming more recognized as occurring after uh, or during neurological diseases as well, primary progressive aphasia. We can look at a variety of other things too. I just wanted to mention these, um, which I won't be talking about today, but one is propositional, which is the level of how well does a sentence make sense? At the sentence level, is there a lot of uh, coherent information being produced? You can look beyond that at uh, topic management and appropriate event sequencing, which we like to call macro structure. And beyond that, of course, you can look at pragmatics, which is making sure your audience, you, you tailor what you're saying to your audience. So one of the reasons I love language and continue to come back to it and I'm drawn to it um, is I've listed my three top ones here for looking at it in mild cognitive impairment and dementia. The first one is that we know dementia associated behaviors occur many decades before clinical changes are obvious right at the brain level and of course at the behavior level. Um, one of my favorite studies, the Nunn study out of Minnesota, um, found that early life linguistic ability was actually associated with later life vulnerability to dementia, again, highlighting language's importance. Um, and then MCI, in particular, mild cognitive impairment, the criteria has evolved over several years. I was listening to a podcast on my one hour drive here today from Dr. Peterson out of the Mayo Clinic talking about the changes in MCI diagnoses over the years. And he highlighted how language was actually a cognitive process that's becoming really important in differentiating different types of mild cognitive impairment. It's not just memory that's affected. Language is one of the biggest processes that they think is actually pretty sensitive to looking at MCI. And that's what we're going to focus on today. And there's another group of people that I'm particularly passionate about, and it is those individuals who have had a stroke, but don't test as having clinical aphasia. But when you talk to them, they say, I have language issues. When I'm speaking to my family or friends, so much so that they feel they can't go back to work but you take them on a typical neuropsych battery for language and they test at basically ceiling. They test like they don't have any impairments. Um, and so we've tended to call this group those having latent aphasia in my field. Um, and they're a really important group because they are the ones that we can get back to work if we understand what their issues really are um, and hopefully improve their quality of life because of that. So we're still understanding where do they think their language impairments are arising and can we actually get that data empirically? Can we use tasks to really look and find that they're doing something different than people who are typical um, without a stroke? So my other reason for looking at this is these individuals with stroke and with MCI are technically have a higher risk of developing dementia down the line, right? They're, the estimates vary. Uh, again, in the podcast this morning, Dr. Peterson was talking it's anywhere from 16 to 20 percent of people with MCI go on to eventually develop a dementia. There have been some estimates in the literature up to 50 percent in stroke, more of a vascular dementia. Um, but we want to figure out, are there really early language differences in these individuals that we could prognostically, we could use prognostically to say, 
you have a higher chance of developing this. Can we get a behavioral intervention going earlier to maybe slow it down? So that's the ultimate goal of my research line is to figure out in a prospective study what's happening with language and can we use it to help us um, differentiate these individuals who are more at risk for developing dementia down the line. Okay, so let me tell you the two variables that I'm gonna to introduce to you today. I am a big fan of simple, and I'm a big fan of things being able to be done in the clinic setting as well as the research setting. It's something that I've been a big proponent of for most of my uh, tenure career. So the two variables that I'm gonna to give to you today, we have tested out in the clinical settings and people can do this live while listening to people um, tell stories, any, any form of discourse really. The first one um, is from some colleagues of mine. We call it the core lexicon, or I'll call it core lex during this topic. Um, what they do is they produce some relevant um, lexemes while they talk, right? You give them a topic. A lexeme is, um, the lexeme sing encompasses all the morphological word forms. So sing is the lexeme. Here's all the options you could produce, but they all count as a single core lex item. So an example that I gave you earlier was that cat rescue picture description. Um, my colleagues had a lot of healthy adults, um, a normative sample produced that cat picture description, and they came up with this list of core lexical items that more than or equal to 50% of those normative sample individuals produced, right? And these are what we're going to call the core lex. They did this for Cinderella as well as the sandwich procedure that I showed you earlier, right? This is a measure of topic appropriate lexical access. That's important. You might also notice though, it includes all sorts of parts of speech. Right? You've got some nouns, dog, department, you should have some verbs up here as well, some adjectives, some adverbs, right? some determiners like a and the. So you've got a variety of topic appropriate lexemes that could be produced. The other one is a measure of lexical diversity. It's just how many different words do you produce during this? It's a very, very common measure. Um, it's very easy to get, but it's surprisingly sensitive at what people can access while telling stories, right? How many number of different words can you produce? So again, we like without much effort, but does this get us much bang for our buck in differentiating um, individuals with latent aphasia, MCI, and those neurotypical controls, healthy aging? Okay, so I want to just introduce you to my sample. Um, this, both of these uh, MCI data sets and then these two over here are from two corpus um, settings. So I'm gonna show you those corpus at the end, I'll acknowledge them. Um, so this is all retrospectively looking at corpus data. So the MCI group, mild cognitive impairment is out of the University of Delaware. Uh, my colleague, Alyssa Lanzi has collected this data. Um, what you'll notice is that this group is significantly older than our aphasia group. It's not surprising. Um, those of you who have worked in the world of stroke know that the age of stroke is drastically going down in the US. Um, it's traditionally been around 65 years old. In our samples in the last five years, our average is closer to 50. Um, so the age of stroke is, is going down and there are a few reasons for that. This is not a surprising finding. Um, in healthy aging, we've got about a 71 year old um, average here. So our stroke group, just to summarize, is significantly younger than the other two, uh, despite our best abilities. Um, the other thing I want to note, and we're going to come back to this later, uh, is this distinct lack of representation of anyone who is uh, not white in the sample. And this is a corpus issue. Um, it exists beyond just um, dementia and aphasia corpuses, right? It's in most um, English-based corpuses, we have this distinct uh, lack of racial and ethnic diversity, and it really is an issue for drawing larger conclusions um, because we know especially Black or African American women have much higher rates of stroke in particular, as well as dementia, um, and so we're not getting a really representative sample here. Uh, those neuropsychologists in the audience will see some scores they're familiar with over here. Um, the bottom two are just overall cognitive, um, and those who aren't in speech world may not recognize this, but this is the metric that is usually used to qualify if you have clinical aphasia or not, um, and you have to score under a 93.8 to be ranked as having clinical aphasia, and you'll notice no one in this sample does, right? They all score above the cutoff, so they're that latent group that I mentioned. Okay, so 
first thing we wanted to do is just, is there a significant difference between these groups on our two very simple language items? Okay, so we did some um, analysis of variance with some covariates. We had to include age, of course, because we do have an age distinction here in the three groups. I also included sex because there's really a lot of research out there on impacts of sex on when people develop um, uh, dementia in particular, and then there's some interesting relationships of language use and sex. So that's why we included it as a possible model. So let me summarize and bring this up really quickly, and I have a, a text slide to make this a lot easier to read. Um, the big takeaway is that the picture description, which is the one you see on the left, we are not seeing any significant difference in whether they produced a context-relevant lexical item across any of the three groups. It's not a sensitive metric for us right now, that picture description. You can think about it as being the cookie theft. It looks the exact same. In the middle, you've got our fictional narrative, Cinderella. This is doing a great job of differentiating both the MCI and the aphasia group from the healthy aging group. Healthy aging individuals are producing far more content relevant lexical items in the other two groups. And then in our uh, procedural narrative, the sandwich here over at the right, um, our aphasia and our uh, healthy aging groups are significantly different, but actually the MCI and aphasia groups um, are performing relatively similarly. And then if we look at number of different words, right, this is our other interesting uh, variable here, we find a very similar pattern, right? So we're getting differentiation of healthy aging from both aphasia and MCI in particular in the Cinderella. So let me give you some text just to highlight this. So narratives in particular are pretty sensitive to differences in that core lexical item um, and number of words. And I might offend a few people here, I hope I don't, but picture descriptions are not super sensitive at finding language difference across these groups. So I know that we all kind of love the picture description for its ease of access, and it's been used, the cookie theft in particular, in, in Alzheimer's for a very long time. Um, so I'm just gonna encourage you to maybe think about collecting some other data in addition to it if you're looking for language impairments. Um, and we need to do some more research on impact of sex, which for time purposes, I won't go too much into detail here. Significant differences are great, but they don't tell us anything about classification. So it's really important to do more sophisticated modeling to figure out just how useful are these two language variables for actually differentiating our groups in a classification model. So linear discriminant analysis is a supervised model, meaning that we're telling it there are two groups to differentiate. We're not letting it kind of look for how many groups. We're telling it there are two, and then we're giving it two different models age, sex, and our Corlex item, or age, sex, and our different words item. And we're asking it, after you've seen 50% of the data and you've trained on it, I want you to predict the 50% you haven't been trained on, the unseen data. So our big takeaway here is that if we're trying to differentiate the aphasia group from the MCI group, if we're trying to predict membership of either of those groups, we're gonna rely more heavily on a procedural narrative if we're trying to, and this is critical, I think, for this group of people listening, if we're trying to figure out what to look at to differentiate MCI from our healthy aging, our fictional narrative is doing the best job for either number of different words or core lex, doesn't matter. Right? Something about that, the fictional narrative is doing a much better job than the other two. And then over here to our right, if you're trying to differentiate this very subtle aphasia group from healthy controls, we are again coming back to that fictional narrative being pretty important to look at. So with my last 40 seconds, we'll wrap it up. Um, what I wanted to hopefully give you today is that these are both really easy variables to calculate. I have a calculator for you on the last slide if you're interested in core lexical items for discourse, um, and it fills a need for a sensitive and user-friendly cognitive assessment you could add. I also wanna highlight that not just Cinderella, but narratives that make people integrate life experience and knowledge are really, really useful and might be more sensitive for differentiating these subtle language impairment groups from neurotypical. If we follow this prognostically down the line, right, maybe we can see early on individuals performing slightly less well on these narratives and being able to predict an eventual steeper decline from those individuals. Again, I'm sorry if I offend anyone for this fourth item, but maybe picture description is not the end all be all. Maybe we can think of including a few more complicated narratives um, in our assessment because it, picture description kind of didn't do so well in either of these assessments um, with differentiating our individuals from healthy aging. 
And my last one here, I hope will be talked about more with Dr. Dilworth Anderson's plenary, uh, but we have a lot of work to do to make our data sets more inclusive and representative across a variety of metrics. Um, some I mentioned race and ethnicity, but languages spoken is another one. We have a huge bilingual population in the US. Most of the corpus data out there for clinical samples is monolingual. And that's not very representative of who we're trying to serve. Um, and I would also love to do, and I'm currently hopefully writing a grant on, um, collecting data longer term across individuals with at, who are at risk for MCI to see if these language variables do predict um, eventual cognitive decline. So with that, I will thank individuals for listening. Um, and if you really do want to do some discourse and get a free app that'll tell you what the Corelex is, you can screenshot that and hopefully that'll be helpful. Thank you.